Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Fullerton and today I want to talk to you about electromagnetism. Our objectives are going to be to describe the factors affecting an induced potential difference due to magnetic field lines interacting with moving charges, describe the three right-hand rules for magnetism, and finally we'll see if we can't calculate the magnetic force on a moving electrical charge. So electromagnetism has to do with moving electric charges creating magnetic fields. And the symbol for magnetic field strength is a capital B. And the SI units for magnetic field strength are Tesla, capital T. And a lot of this work began in around 1820 when Danish physicist Hans Christian Oersted found that a current running through a wire created a magnetic field. And you can actually see this. If you take a compass and put it near a wire that has a current running through it, you will see the compass line up with the magnetic field caused by the current running through that wire. Now, when we do this, if you put current through a wire, create a magnetic field. If you make a coil of wire and have current running through it, call that a solenoid. We've made an electromagnet. Because we're using current, we have an electrical magnet or electromagnet. Fairly strong, and we can even make it stronger if we go put an iron core in the middle, in the middle of our solenoid, we get a much, much, much stronger magnetic field. So that's how you make an electromagnet. Current running through a wire creates a magnetic field. Coil it up, it gets even stronger. If you put an iron core in the middle, it gets much, much, much stronger. The first right-hand rule will tell us the direction of the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire. The general idea is, let's assume we have current running upwards through this as a wire. Point the thumb of your right hand in the direction conventional or positive current flows and wrap your hand around that wire. The direction your fingers point or curl as they wrap around the wire tells you the direction of the magnetic field. You have to use your right hand, but this works pretty well. For example, over here on the right, we have a picture of positive current moving upward through a wire. The magnetic field goes in front of it on its way to the right and behind it on the way to the back. So it's in a circle, a circular path around that wire. It's a sample question. Determine the direction of the magnetic field above and below the current carrying wire. All right, if you put your thumb in the direction, thumb of your right hand, in the direction of positive current flow, then wrap your fingers around it, you'll see that as it above the wire, the fingers come toward you. So that means the magnetic field is coming toward you above the wire. We represent that by putting dots, circles around them on the paper, almost as if you're looking at the tip of an arrowhead as it's coming toward you. Around the bottom of the wire, your fingers go away from you. That means that the magnetic field is pointing away from you, or into the plane of the screen. We represent with X's. The X's remind you as if you're looking at the back of an arrow, the feathers, the fletching of an arrow moving away from you. So you can represent the three, these three-dimensional vectors with the dots or the arrows. So in this case, above the wire, it's coming toward us. Below the wire, it's moving away from us. Now, wrapping a current carrying wire into a coil or solenoid creates an electromagnet. If you place an iron core inside the solenoid, you get a much stronger magnetic field. And we can use the second right-hand rule to tell us the direction of the induced magnetic field. If you have a solenoid, what you're going to do is wrap the fingers of your right hand around the solenoid in the direction with the coil that the current is flowing. Again, conventional current or positive current is what we're going to use. Wrap your fingers in that direction, and the thumb of your right hand will point to the north. Of course, the opposite direction must be the south of the induced magnetic field. So, question two. The air core of an electromagnet is replaced with an iron core. Compared to the strength of the magnetic field in the air core, the strength of the magnetic field in the iron core is less, greater, or the same. Well, when you put iron in the core of an electromagnet, it gets much stronger, so the magnetic field must be greater. Relative motion between charges and magnetic fields produces a magnetic force on the charge. Moving charges create magnetic fields, and charges moving through magnetic fields feel a force. The magnitude of this force, force magnetic, F sub B, is equal to the charge, Q, 
times its velocity, V, meters per second, times the magnetic, magnetic field strength, B, in Tesla, times the sine of the angle between the velocity vector and the direction of the magnetic field. And you can find its direction using the third right-hand rule. The trick here is you point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the velocity a positive charge would be moving. So if you know an electron is moving in one direction, the positive charge would be the opposite direction. So point your fingers in the direction a positive charge would move. If it's negative, flip it around. Then curl your fingers 90 degrees in the direction of the magnetic field. So point your fingers in the direction of the velocity, curl them in the direction of the magnetic field, and the direction your thumb points is the direction of the force that is felt on these different charges. It's actually a cross product for those of you who have played with vector math in a little bit more depth. But you can figure out the direction using the third right-hand rule. Sample question three. An electron moves at 2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second perpendicular to a magnetic field having a flux density or a magnetic field strength of 2 teslas. What is the magnitude of the magnetic force on the electron? Well, the magnetic force on the electron, the magnitude is QVB sine theta. Well, our charge is going to be negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Our velocity 2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Magnetic field strength, 2 tesla. And then the sine of 90 degrees, since they're at right angles, is just going to be 1. So that's going to give us a magnetic force of about negative 6.4 times 10 to the minus 13 newtons. Now, since it asks for magnitude, we don't need to remember the negative there. It's only asking for how big it is, not direction. So the correct answer must be 2. 6.4 times 10 to the minus 13 newtons. Another one, we have a particle with the charge of 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and it experiences a force of 2 times 10 to the minus 12 newtons as it travels through a 3 tesla magnetic field at an angle of 30 degrees to the field. Find the particle's velocity. Well, we can use our same equation. Magnetic force equals QVB sine theta. But we're looking for velocity. So let's solve for velocity, getting that all by itself. V equals <laughs> magnetic force FB. Field strength times the sine of theta. Now we can substitute in. Velocity equals 2 times 10 to the minus 12 newtons divided by our charge, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Magnetic field strength, 3 tesla, times the sine of 30 degrees. Run all that through my calculator, and I come up with a velocity of about 2.08 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. Pretty straightforward. Electromagnetic induction is a very, very useful property. Relative motion between a conductor and a magnetic field can induce a potential difference or a voltage in the conductor. Now the conductor must cut across magnetic field lines and you get more induced potential, a bigger potential difference, more voltage, with stronger magnetic fields and faster movement. Applications of this are in generators. This is how we convert kinetic energy into electrical energy. We use these with hydroelectric power, fossil fuels, nuclear power, wind turbines. If you look over on the right, we have a water turbine. The general idea is water comes in, turns that fan, and as that fan spins, it spins this rotor on top, and we have a stator there. Now the rotor either has coils of wire or magnets, and the stator has the opposite. So you're moving wires in a magnetic field to induce a potential difference. You're turning that kinetic energy into electrical energy. That's very straightforward for hydroelectric power. Fossil fuels, they burn the coal to create steam, to create heat, used to turn water into steam. The steam is used to spin a turbine, just like we have on the right there. Nuclear power, same idea, nuclear reaction, heats up water. That water is converted into steam. The steam spins a turbine. And wind turbines, you don't even have that first step. 
you just go straight from the wind into turning the turbine and converting that into a potential difference, which we use to drive our electrical system. Sample question here. The diagram in the bottom left shows a wire moving to the right at some speed v through a uniform magnetic field directed into the page. Hence all the exits showing the back of the arrow as it goes away from us. As the speed of the wire is increased, will the induced potential difference increase, decrease, or remain the same? Well, if you recall, the induced potential difference increases as the speed increases. So our induced potential difference must increase in this scenario. One more question. Diagram represents a wire conductor, RS, positioned perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field directed into the page. Again, the X is the back of the arrow. Describe the direction in which the wire could be moved to produce the maximum potential difference across its ends, R and S. And if you remember to get the maximum potential difference, the movement of your conductor relative to the magnetic field has to cut across magnetic field lines. So an easy answer would be either to the right or to the left would give you a maximum potential difference. There is much, much more to electromagnetism and electromagnetic induction. We're only barely scraping the surface. But hopefully this will at least get you started. If you're looking for more information, need more help, visit aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.